There's no other place to be on Memorial Day than with U.S. troops out doing their job. That's the day we'll be able to get this story on the air. That's how we ended up with Captain James Alex Funkhauser that morning. Captain Funkhauser, when I first met him, I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> Boy Scout alert, this guy is like, everything's working, everything's great. I'm not going to be able to put this guy on the air. He's not a realist. He kept talking. He started talking about the fact that he loved this job, he believed in what he was doing, but the Iraqis, well, they weren't quite up to par yet, and he started telling me the problems he was having with them. Cultural differences, lack of discipline, and I thought, oh, he's leveling with me. This I can, this I can put on the air. Americans will listen to this man. We got into Humvees, and he said the first place we're going is a place where, as you heard, a roadside bomb went off the day before and it hit an Iraqi patrol. He said, there are two purposes. I want to show the Iraqis it's safe to go back in the water. They're not going to go on that street where they lost a couple people yesterday until we go. And then the second thing he said is, I want to look into the eyes of the people who live on that street. They know who planted that bomb. They know if an insurgent cell has moved in there. So our first stop, we parked the Humvees, we all got outside, and Paul and James are, they've got their gear, they're looking around for something to shoot. They asked me, what's up? And I said, we're looking for Iraqis to talk to. And they're like, okay, we got it. So they go off. I see them out of the corner of my eye ahead of us. And Captain Funkhauser starts explaining to me, see, we think the insurgent cell might have moved into that, it's like, see that villa next to us? And I'm like trying to look without looking. There's a high wall next to us and a bombed out villa on the other side. And he said, you know, they could be watching us right now. And they were. Not from that villa, actually from an apartment block just ahead of us, about eight stories up. They waited until we were all within about 20, some of us closer, feet of the car bomb right across from the T-stand and they command detonated it with a cell phone. Approximately 500 pounds of explosives turned the car into a wall of burning shrapnel headed for all of us. Now, I didn't know at the time that Captain Funkhauser and his translator were killed immediately, and so was James, our sound man. Paul and I were both left fighting for our lives, as were two of the soldiers you saw, um, Staff Sergeant Reed and Justin Farrar, the guy who had the striped shirt on, who Captain Funkhauser had made stay back protecting me. Uh, and he, he blamed himself for a long time for not being next to Captain Funkhauser to try to save him or be in the way of the shrapnel that killed his captain. Just to tell you a little bit of what was wrong with me, I had a small piece of shrapnel in my brain. Both femurs were shattered, one of them in three places. My femoral artery was nicked, and I was studded with burning shrapnel from my hips to my ankles. I was losing blood at a rapid rate. There were so many of us down that my medic from our patrol um, ran out of supplies. So did the medic from the Iowa National Guard who ran in. The guard had been driving by, heard the explosion, turned around and, and they all ran straight in to help us even though there, were, uh, there was an exploding, um, that one of the Humvees had, been, had caught on fire and ammunition was going everywhere. It took an hour for the CASVAC team to get to us, the casualty evacuation team, because there were five other car bombs in Baghdad that day. They went to two of the wrong locations first, one of them being the wrong car bomb before they found us. And an Iowa National Guardsman tied the tourniquets on me and kept talking to me to keep me alive. He did not think I was going to make it, but he said he was not going to let me die alone. Two other people from the guard stayed with Paul until his last breath. In the hospital, as you saw, I uh, coded, turns out, I coded about five times. That means I was technically dead five times. And they gave me 40 units of blood, and they started the process of rebuilding me, first digging out a lot of shrapnel and then rebuilding me, which took about two and a half months. Now, 
Along the way, I found out what it's like when some of you out there are journalism school students. It is the worst possible thing to be on the other end of the camera. Picture it. There I was on the tarmac. You saw a couple of those shots of me in um, stretchers. And you know when you're a trauma patient, kind of a lot of your internal functions become external functions and other things do them for you and they're all hanging around your bed or your mobile um, stretcher. This is not what you want on national television. This is not your best day. And, you know, we pulled up to one of the planes that was transporting me, and there was this army of cameras. I'd been told they would be 100 feet back. They were only 20 feet away. I, I try to explain I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I'm not trying to do these things because um, I like risking my life. I like being where your reporting can sometimes change American policy, change world policy, you know, where you can really affect lives. And I'm suited to it, it's what I've tried my whole life to become, a foreign correspondent. And in terms of do I think I'm going to feel fear when I go back into any of those places? Absolutely. I felt fear the last time. I always did. And any good military commander you speak to, and I'm talking special forces, uh, marines, etc., will all tell you the same thing. You feel the fear, but you do it anyway. That's, you, you don't want to be in the foxhole with a person who feels no fear. That's the wrong person. You know, it, fear tells you where to be careful and how best to mitigate risks. It's the only way to tell a lot of these stories. And also think about the fact that, you know, we can choose to walk in and out. We're trying to tell the stories of the people who don't have a choice. And that's worth the risk.